thanks a lot for having me and no pressure like 500 people in there another 500 out there cool and that works right so we're going to talk a little bit about networking uh, just to get an idea who has been using go six months or less oh shit a year or less okay and the rest of you since the beginning okay cool um, the only interesting bit of information on that slide is probably that I'm a developer turned ops. I've been doing software for a few years now, and um, since 2014, essentially, I'm a gopher. I, I'm doing everything in, in Go. If you want to follow along, follow up, and given the new setup, I'm not actually going to type the stuff in there. It wouldn't have been possible with that mic anyways. So you would just trust me that uh, the code that I show you actually execute. You can also grab the code and um, the commands I'm using from that uh, URL here. So everything is there, everything's online. That's the reason why I can present now. All right, quick uh, look at the agenda. Looks more than it really is. Uh, unfortunately, because it's only half an hour, I don't really have the time to go into really deep detail. Uh, but if you are interested in, you know, hit me up. I'm here until Monday. All right, the net package. The TLDR of that talk is essentially how forking awesome uh, Go is because it brings so many things already, you know, typically in the standard library and has awesome packages for everything else. So this is a kind of very high level overview of the net package, not very useful, just a screenshot. Um, there are things that you would expect like, you know, HTTP, URL, RPC, uh, mail, SMTP and so on and so forth. And I thought about how can you actually, I, I try to come up with a visualization that makes more sense if you're coming from the networking side. So who of you is comfortable with looking at that network layer stack? Pretty much everybody, right? Cool. Awesome. So then we can just, you know, I, I just, you know, I'm not going to explain what these things are. Just one anecdotal thing. I think it was Vin Cerf who said, we won because we uh, focused on the implementation, not on the documentation. Otherwise, we would be looking at the OSI 7 layers. But yeah, th that's where we are. So on the physical uh, layer there, obviously .NET interface and hardware address. The thing here, I don't know if that pointer works. Yeah, that is pretty kick-ass. Um, I had a look at that. Essentially, allows you to dig into the, the Ethernet packages and so on. So if you if you're down there, IoT or whatever, and you really want to look at packages on that level, um, uh, go and have a look at that. Networking layer, uh, you have multiple things to represent IPv4 or 6 addresses, and then, um, you know, also masking and so on and so forth. And then Go packet, which is kind of like Google's Go packet, which is kind of like um, on that layer as well. Moving up the stack, uh, transport layer, uh, you have connection, IP connection. Um, and then the application layer, pretty rich. Uh, and as you can see, so the black stuff is uh, part of the standard lib, and the blue stuff is, you know, not yet part of the standard lib. Um, yeah, so as I said already, things like HTTP, URL, and so on, all of that is, is built in. And then there are a few things which I wish that would be built in, and I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, who, who is here from the Go team who might be able to clarify that? Some, I heard someone earlier. No? So. Is there any good reason why WebSocket is not in the standard library? Okay, who of you wants to have WebSocket in the standard library? Give me a yay! Uh, that will probably be 1.15. All right, so I, I keep using Gorilla WebSocket. There are probably others as well. Um, yeah, we're going to have a look at that later. So um, I think, I personally think uh, this does not totally suck. Probably there are better ways to visualize it, but at least you get a, an idea w on which layer certain packages um, work. If you have any question, you know, feel free. So the first example we're going to have a look at is uh, a curl, mini curl, uh, really in a few lines of code. Um, essentially, essentially focusing on, on this part here, right? So you, we do a HTTP get here with the URL provided by the argument, um, and then using HTTP util dump response to just you know, uh, have a look at the, at the result. And uh, 
this, I mean, obviously the real goal has a, a few more features, but this already kind of like shows you the power of, of the, the actual build in the standard lib stuff. Um, yeah, okay, so second part here that actually, you know, pulls out the stuff from the, the body, um, and then in, in this case, the, the example used here essentially allows you to uh, specify the the amount of like the pay payload in, in bytes that you actually want to display then, um, just to show you how you can, you know, read, so read only partial uh, responses there. Next example would be an app server, so some something that has an HTTP API and responds with hopefully something useful. So in this case, uh, actually, that would already be the FOSTEM Go Dev Room with 3000 if they would fit in. So in this case, you're essentially just using the, the standard vanilla HTTP handle func and um, provide the path. So whenever I do a curl or HTTP on, um, you know, it's running on 9876, the port, slash about, then I would um, expect to get back this um, uh, this struct in, in JSON, encoded in JSON. And believe me, you know, if I would have my own laptop, I would now do curl, da da da, and you would see that JSON there. Again, pretty pretty straightforward. The only thing, and I'm going to talk about that a little bit later around the best practices, is that this here is a little bit too convenient, a little bit too, like the defaults could be a little bit better. Again, if you disagree with anything here, you know, please, uh, Tell me later. Um, this is essentially what I'm, I'm kind of criticizing. Like, if, you, if you're doing that, right, you're probably doing something wrong. What you really should be doing, and someone uh, thankfully put together a gist, so I didn't have to do that, and that's the kind of like the, the, the gist of the whole, <laughs> the gist of the gist, um, the, the real thing here. So you really want to set timeouts here. Um, you really, uh, you, you can have, um, a handler here for tracing the, the request in here, an error logger, and so on and so forth. So, so really, like, it's there, so please use it. It is in the standard library, please use it. Do use timeouts, do use retries. The next example that I had um, is around a very, very, like, silly, stupid, simple uh, RPC client server that essentially in this case, it's really just you know a, a fixed call. Um, so have a look at the the server here. Essentially, is listening again on a certain port. In our case, one two three four, and then just waits um, for for incoming connection and then executes um, on the server side a certain um, method here. And the method is um, essentially just multiplication. So it takes two input parameters and then multiplies them and gives that back. And the, the, sorry, that was the client. Oops, that was the client. Uh, and the server side effectively just um, yeah, sits there and waits uh, until client connects and RPC client connects and uh, calls a certain function. That is great. I'm, I'm kind of like on the fence here with the RPC built-in standard library. It's, it's, you know, good enough. Uh, but there are, I'm going to come back to that in a moment, um, better options or more flexible, more powerful options. Any questions so far? Okay. Second level programming. Um, I love that. I, I didn't put the, the link to the video there. Um, I think it was LinuxCon Australia or something like that. Um, a guy giving a talk about, um, yeah, essentially IPv6. And that, that really, like, took a snap of that. That really fascinated me. So if you compare IPv4 with IPv6, just a summary here, just to get everyone on the same page, this one here is the real, the real thing, right? So if you assign every IP address essentially some weight, it would be 75 milligrams for all the IPv4 addresses that we have and roughly the, the mass of the Earth that IPv6 has, which means that's quite a lot of addresses, right? So a lot of things um, are possible and will change. But unfortunately, which I'm still pointing out there, you know, it's a bit like the the year of Linux desktop, right? It, it's any, every, every year it will happen, and um, yet still, 2018, we're still using IPv4 like that. Anyways, um, quick reminder, recap regarding ports. 
everyone familiar with ports and those different ranges here, privileged, well-known ports, IANA registered ones and ephemeral ones, yeah. Okay, cool. Um, and, you know, for the next slide, essentially, just we more or less distinguish between connection-oriented TCP, for example, um, that's used by, thank you, by HTTP and many, many others, and connection-less or broadcast uh, types like UDP, uh, which is still used by, by DNS, uh, but I would argue that many, many um, layer 4 protocols nowadays actually use TCP. So in this case, uh, what you would see if I would type it in here uh, would essentially be a HTTP get uh, using the low-level functionality uh, that uh, the, the standard library provides. So we are actually, the, the main things here, we first resolve um, the address, then we uh, use net.aotcp to get there, actually send the uh, head request, so not the get, but the head, sorry, head uh, with, for a HTTP 1.0, and then the, the rest is more or less the same as we have seen earlier on getting the, um, uh, the response back and parsing that and, and um, printing it out. So obviously, for HTTP, you probably don't want that, but you can use that pattern for, for other um, layer 4 protocols uh, to just you know, build your own uh, client or whatever uh, using these low-level primitives. Uh, can be very useful. So I'm halfway through the time and my talk. That's awesome. So let's see. Time out and retries. So who has, who has not used either time out or retries in their production code? Everyone, you liars. Come on. I, I'm raising my hand. I, I am guilty. So it is still very much the case uh, and given you know cloud, public cloud, and this and that, that you know either the network between you and you know your favorite uh, cloud provider, or within the cloud provider, or any third-party services that might you might be calling out to, which is increasingly so the case, this is not reliable. So you will run into um, things that you know it just times out. And if your code is not aware of that, um, well, you're probably gonna debug, and then you probably should use Delph. Um, and it's really, it's like, there is, it's minimal overhead. It's not like that you need to, to invest a lot of time and pretty much natively support it within the standard library. So please, please, do use timeouts, do use retries for that. Um, and to me, like I nowadays would say this is really a hard requirement for production level or production quality software. If you don't do that, the code review should be, should point that out. There are uh, three resources I found, uh, reviewed many, but these three, I cut it down to these three that I personally think really are very, very helpful. If uh, any one of you is in the audience or is looking live, hello, um, thank you for putting that together. That's um, very, very helpful. Security, who doesn't like security? I must say I'm pretty, again, very, very impressed when I had a look first when I came to go. Uh, to what extent Go really provides security-related um, features. Uh, we know crypto, um, and there are many, many uh, things that you can use out of the box or, or um, you know, packages that are available. And essentially, again, pretty much like with the timeouts and retries, if you don't leverage that, if you, you know, don't use TLS and many, many other things around there, then uh, you know, don't come and complain. It's not uh, Go's fault. DNS, that, that is probably my most favorite topic. And maybe, either now or over a beer, someone can explain to me, like my hunch would be, it's probably due to portability reasons, but why the fork does Go have two options here? Why does it you know, have the pure Go resolver and the Seagull-based resolver there? I have no idea. If you uh, know the answer, please hit me up or, or yell at me now. I am more than happy to learn. Essentially, what it means, uh, so a very, very simple example, just to you know, grab something, FQDN, and, and look it up. And luckily, I put the, the result here as well. So if I do that on my local laptop with the Go debug net DNS set to CGO, I actually can resolve, I don't know if you see it here, uh, that's the name of my you know, .local domain on you know, my machine. Well, not my machine, but you know, the one that doesn't work. And I would actually get uh, an IP address here. So the DNS lookup here would work. If I do the same with NetDNS Go, it panics, right? 
So I'm not like I'm not judging that fact. I'm just really, really, really. If every, if you forget everything else, but please remember that, and it will probably <laughs> save you a few gray hairs or a couple of your life, a couple of hours of your life getting back if you're uh, running into that issue in in whatever setup. It certainly did for me. DNS. So my favorite topic is gone. Coming back to RPC, getting more and more um, interesting, and, and uh, thank you, um, you know, uh, the, the, the rest hype, if you wish, uh, seeing a little bit of, of uh, yeah, competition here from RPC. So, as I said, it's perfectly okay, I think, to use uh, what the standard library offers you in terms of RPC. If that doesn't help you, or if, if you're limited by that, here you have two great choices, gRPC, um, originally created by Google, and I believe it's pretty much the same that, that they're using internally. It's now a CNCF project, the Cloud Native um, Computing Foundation project. It's very fast and powerful. I guess the only reason that Twitch came up with um, Twerp here is that it requires HTTP2. So uh, Twitch apparently was initially a, a gRPC user, and then said, well, we'd really like to use HTTP 1.1, and we would like to have a non-binary JSON representation, which makes it easier to debug. And uh, that's why they came up with Twerp. Pretty new, a uh, couple of weeks or, or so old, uh, so I didn't really have a chance to go deep into, into that, so I can't really answer questions around it. If anyone from Twitch or who has used that already is here, uh, I'd love to talk with you. And then there are a bunch of other um, non-standard li libraries or, or packages uh, that I encourage you to check out. Uh, we already had uh, the WebSocket there and, and uh, the Epix Gateway. Uh, DNSFS is a pretty cool hack uh, implementing a file system on DNS. That's pretty nice. Uh, we had Google Go Packet, uh, Packet Inspection, and uh, for low-level stuff, Ethernet packet Packets, this one here. So depending on your use case and the situation you're in, you find yourself in, you probably want to have a look at, uh, you know, before you write it yourself, maybe have a look at those things. They, they're pretty kick-ass. Web frameworks. This is probably my second favorite slide on, on that deck. Um, and I could, you know, if I'd be in my laptop, I could actually, actually, Go Present still doesn't support um, videos. That's a feature request, right? We should really have videos in Go Present. It does, but not, which one? <laughs> I love you, Francesc. So this is an animation where this guy goes like into that, you know, time sink. So if you must, if you uh, typically, if you come from another environment, if you're, you know, Ruby on Rails or whatever, and you go like, wow, Go doesn't have, you know, or what, what are the, the frameworks? Well, you know, someone put together the top six, and, and actually that's a, a very nice, um, you know, very nicely done. Um, so there are, of course there are, you know, people, especially coming from different languages, uh, put together these. And, you know, as you can tell from the stars and forks and whatnot, uh, pretty popular. But I also encourage you to read that one here. Because it is quite often true, you don't necessarily need um, stuff like that. A little bit on the fence. Probably I'm, I'm doing the wrong kind of things to actually depend on that. But... It's there, if you want it. Quick recap or summary of best practices writing networked applications. In general, um, there is this old, you know, the, the fallacies of distributed computing. I gave a GovCon talk last year uh, about that. And it's, again, it's still very valid and probably even more so. Uh, so be aware of, of the fallacies there. Uh, there is a, a very nice um, context package. I didn't really go into great detail earlier on, so do use the, the context package wisely. And again, reminder, do use timeouts, do use retries. And obviously the three Ts. Test, test, test. Uh, in terms of, and, and I, I'm coming from the Kubernetes land, so this kind of like health checking, probing is, is kind of like you know built in. There are two kind of philosophies there, or two ways to approach that. You can either subscribe to the idea that you push the instrumentation to the developer. So it's you actually writing uh, instrument the code, uh, pprov, uh, there's go metrics, whatever. Or you kind of like outsource that to a service mesh like Istio or Conduit. Um, they have sidecars and they essentially 
um, do that stuff for you. Uh, whatever you do, uh, please do it. Any, any kind of metrics, either the developer themselves or uh, some other thing that sits on the sides and does it for you. It's really useful, really, really helpful. And, and with that, I'm already on the last slide and happy to have a discussion. A number of things that um, are very, very useful if you are not that deep into networking with Go. Uh, I based many of the examples on this wonderful online uh, available book, Network Programming with Go by Jan. And then there are a couple of other um, you know, blog posts and so on that, that I really, um, you know, depending on, on what you're into, GRPC or whatever level, um, would encourage you to read. And with that, I'm open for questions. Thank you. Before we do the Q&A, quick reminder, if you're in between my face and the camera, you're on the video. Uh, we're going to do the Q&A, and afterwards, I'm going to have to kick every single person that is standing up out of the room. <laughs> it's not my rules. Uh, so please make sure that there's no free seats anywhere. I remove all my stuff from my seat, so if someone wants to use my seat, I will be just chilling here. So please try to do that. And now Q&A. Any questions? Yes, please. Quick comment, Q&A, so we're going to accept only questions, especially because we cannot hear you. So if you have a question, please go for it. Thank you. Okay, just to quickly recap what you said, it's essentially the, the DNS stuff that I mentioned there, essentially uh, more or less to be more flexible to, to accommodate a, a range of different naming resolution systems. Okay, thanks. I'm going to build that in. Any other questions? That seems not the case. You're just scratching yourself, right? Okay, cool. Okay. Yeah. The question was if I rec if I have any recommendations for libraries like PCAP, and yes, the the, um, the answer is it is in that slide. It was the um, uh, uh, Go Pack. Yeah. Thank you. So have a look at that, and um, I tried it out. It's it's pretty pretty kick ass. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.